powered by the Montana Television Network. This is the 10 o'clock news on Q2, Montana's news leader. Good evening and happy Thanksgiving. Uh, thanks for joining us tonight. I'm David Jay. Jay and Janelle have the night off. Suicide on Montana's reservations has prompted state officials to instigate a change. Governor Steve Bullock says he often feels like the counselor in chief, the consoler in chief, that is, since he has attended so many funerals of people who have chosen to end their own lives, many of them young Native Americans. Tonight, MTN's Jill Valley goes on special assignment to hear what's going to take uh, to save those lives on the state's reservations. Scroll through Josiah Nichols' Facebook page and you'll see a teenager who loves his family, has a great head of hair, is a basketball player for Two Eagle River School, a talented native singer, and someone who has scores of friends. Many of those friends filled the hallways of the hospital the night Josiah decided to die by suicide. I don't know exactly what happened that day. I just remember my phone call, getting my phone call. And I was crying and I was shaking. It was his face, so I tried to call him. His phone just rang and rang and rang. A week before his death, he posted this on Facebook. They were words of despair. They were followed by words of love and support from his friends, but it did not change what was about to happen. My baby was laying there. My heart. I can feel it shattered all I wanted. That's my baby. I just wanted him to open his eyes. Josiah was just 16 years old. His death was one of 20 confirmed suicides in the Mission Valley community since last November. There's no statistic pointing to how many were attempted. Montana's Native Americans have the highest rate of suicide in a state that already has one of the highest rates in the country. I'm in part haunted by what you're here to work on. Last month, Governor Steve Bullock launched the Zero Suicide Academy. It's a major component of a statewide plan to reduce suicides. The goal here is to share ideas that people can take back and put to use in their own communities to examine what's happening on their own reservations. There are no easy answers, but the conversation is well underway. Suicide isn't something that you can address and it's gonna go away. It's a symptom of much bigger issues. And so what we want to think about is what else do we need to do? Who do we need to pull together? What have other tribes done that have helped them address this as a key issue of wellness across Indian country? Suicide is also a topic that's now talked about openly in schools because it has to be. We've taken an open stance as far as it's not something that should be pushed behind or not talked about when somebody comes up um, or has a, uh, questions or it comes up in class. It's something that we have agreed as a staff to discuss or maybe not there um, at a different time with, with those students. It's an issue that affects young people deeply as they watch their peers and friends struggle. Many believe suicide has become a bigger issue than bullying. After several suicides in the Mission Valley last spring, the student leaders of St. Ignatius High School went to their teachers and said they want training to know what to do if they have a classmate in crisis because they know often a young person contemplating suicide will reach out to their peers before their parents. It'd be nice to know what to do in that situation. So that's why we want like the leaders in our groups to be trained in something so that way when their friends do reach out or people do reach out to them, they do know how to handle it. The right way. There's no one reason why someone might choose to end their life. For Native Americans, tribal leaders say the answer to their pain cannot be suicide. That pain needs a voice. While this is a really sad time for us, um, it is also an opportunity for us to really put a mark in the sand and do business differently. We are really saying that we need to figure out a different way of addressing our issues, issues that have gone back for generations. Sherry often reads the note her son left behind, searching for answers that just aren't there. She can still see his face in photos, hear his voice singing back at her on an iPad, but it's not the same. I don't get to see him anymore. I still wait up for him. 
and I know it's time to come home. On special assignment, Jill Valley, MTN News. And Josiah was uh, loved by so many friends. Uh, his friends and family often uh, leave messages on his Facebook page. If you are in crisis, you can text the number 741-741 and type in MT for a free 24-7 text line. Late this afternoon, a trailer fire in Lockwood sent smoke across the Billings area. The engulfed single-wide trailer was reported shortly after 4 o'clock. Crews responded to the fire at 3945 Springdale Road. The owner arrived on scene and told Q2 it was no longer livable and had been vacant for two months. Lockwood Fire Chief John Staley says the building is a total loss and an investigation into the fire will resume tomorrow. However, no utilities were active in the trailer, so it's being investigated as suspicious. The re-election battle of Democrat U.S. Senator John Tester is Montana's top electoral race for 2018 and will easily be the most expensive. A year out, Tester already has raised more than $8 million in campaign funds. MTN chief political reporter Mike Dennison tells us more about where he's raising the money. Through September, Senator John Tester had raised nearly $8 million for his re-election campaign and says 13,300 donations have come from Montanans. But when you look at the dollar totals, the vast majority has come from outside the state. Tester has received at least 81% of his funds from non-residents or out-of-state political action committees, $6.3 million in total. And the actual out-of-state percentage is certainly higher. About $800,000 of his total take came from small donations whose geographic source doesn't have to be listed. A good chunk of that money is likely from Montana, but any of those non-itemized donations from out of state will add to the 81% of donations we know are from outside Montana. Through September, just $663,000 of Tester's money had come from identified Montana donors, only 8.5% of his total funds. Californians contributed more, about $708,000, and so did New Yorkers at $813,000. The senator also has received about $2.4 million from political action committees, or PACs, nearly one-third of his total funds raised. Tester's campaign notes that $12 million was spent by outside groups attacking him in his 2012 campaign and says he'll need the resources to fight back against a similar expected onslaught this next year. Tester says he'll be telling his own story to counter the false story his opponents will paint. We know what they're going to do. They're going to try to make me into something I'm not and then run against that person. They tried to do that in 2006. They tried to do that in 2012. The truth is, is we've got to deal with the truth, and if we deal with the truth, I'm going to be just fine. Also, when you look at Tester's potential Republican opponents in the Senate race, some are getting plenty of money from sources other than Montanans. Nearly two-thirds of State Auditor Matt Rosendale's $434,000 has come from outside the state, and Big Sky businessman Troy Downing has received, at most, only 4.5% of his $492,000 from Montanans. 70% of Downing's funds are from his own pocket. 60% of the $168,000 raised by State Senator Al Osheski is from his own pocket as well. But he has raised at least $43,000 from Montanans, or one-fourth of his total. And Republican Russ Fagg? He hasn't revealed his funding sources at all because he used an exploratory committee to raise money before becoming a candidate last month. The former state district judge from Billings says he'll list his donors and spending when he files a campaign report in January. Let's face it. Montana's U.S. Senate contest is essentially a national race, attracting national attention. That means a pile of money will be spent here, and most of that money will come from outside Montana. Reporting from Helena, Mike Dennison, MTN News. And some traded their mountains of food for the real mountains in winter sports. Big Sky Resort opened its season today. Skiers and snowboarders turned out in full force hours ahead of the opening to take advantage of a start of the season. The addition of covered carpet lifts made the below freezing temps a little more bearable. Big Sky reports it's starting the season with a 21-inch uh, mid-mountain base depth and 32-inch uh, upper mountain base depth. Even more snow is possible tonight. Turning to weather now, Bob can tell us uh, how things are and how <laughs> things are for some of these people uh, waiting in line uh, to shop as well. Yeah, they call it Black Friday. A lot of folks call it Black Eye Friday. <laughs> There's a company called Declutter, and what they want to do, they want to find out which states had the most chaotic, chaotic Black Friday and which ones had the most calmest. And it turns out Montana was the calmest of all of the states, and Wyoming had the most chaotic uh, Black Fridays. So they looked at things for the FBI with Joe uh, disorderly conduct charges and personal property damage, and that's what they came up with. So 
well, we're pretty calm here. And if you're going out tomorrow waiting in line, well, you're not going to be that calm. It's going to be a little rainy. It's 3 a.m. in the morning. It'll be cloudy at 6 a.m. And then the sunshine comes out later on by noon. It'll be 52 degrees. So just a little wet in the morning, early, early morning. And then it gets much better from there. Let's go back to David. All right. Thank you, Bob. Americans mark Thanksgiving by eating turkey, watching football, and by hitting the beach. CBS's Chris Martinez is in Los Angeles with more on the many ways we gave thanks. For many, it's a day worth going the distance for. About 51 million Americans traveled to their Thanksgiving destination this year. Turkey was served in Houston, but it was a different holiday than years past. Across the state, families displaced by Hurricane Harvey came together to share Thanksgiving dinner. Huge crowds turned out to watch the Thanksgiving Day Parade in Philadelphia. And in New York, the granddaddy of them all, four new balloons were added to the festivities. Hello, everybody, and happy Thanksgiving. President Trump focused on the military in his first Thanksgiving as commander-in-chief. We're being talked about again as an armed forces. We're really winning. We know how to win. But we have to let you win. They weren't letting you win before. Mr. Trump held a video conference with troops in Afghanistan and later served meals at a Coast Guard station in Florida. Looking for a block, touchdown, Minnesota. Watching football is now a Thanksgiving tradition unto itself. The Minnesota Vikings mark the day by celebrating a touchdown by pantomiming a sit-down meal right in the end zone. We decided to do an untraditional Thanksgiving today, come to the beach. In Southern California, soaring temperatures turned Turkey Day into a beach day. The mercury hit 92 in Los Angeles. That's a record for the holiday and yet another thing for the Golden State to be thankful for. Chris Martinez, CBS News, Los Angeles.